Hey everyone, welcome to Logan's Mosh Pit. Glad to have you here. Do me a favor and please subscribe if you haven't already. Time for another episode of Rock and Read. Over the weekend, I did a poll asking y'all which book you wanted me to read first on my channel. An Elton John book, a Lemmy book, or a Sammy Hagar book. The Lemmy book got the most votes. Therefore, today we'll read chapter one of White Line Fever by Lemmy. Lemmy is, of course, the lead singer of the heavy metal band Motorhead. Because this book was written by Lemmy, I expect every sentence to have the F word. <laughs> Let's begin. Chapter one. I started life in Stoke-on-Trent in the West Midlands of England. Stoke consists of about six towns clustered together. Burslem was the nastiest, so it's only fitting that I was born there. The area is called the Potteries, and the countryside used to be black with slag from the coal used in the kilns that produced all kinds of pottery, including the famous Wedgwood. The ugly slag heaps stretched over the landscape wherever you looked, and the air was dirty with the chimney smoke. By the time my wayward father took off, we had moved to Newcastle, my mum, my gran, and I. Newcastle under Lyme, that is, which is not too far from Stoke. We lived there until I was six months old. Then we moved to Maidley, a village nearby that was really nice. We lived opposite a big pond, nearly a lake, where there were swans. It was beautiful, but definitely amongst the holy poly. My mum had it rough trying to support us on our own. The first job she had was as a TB nurse which was rotten work. Because in those days, it was like being on a terminal cancer ward. So she was more or less just seeing the patients on their way. And she saw TB babies being born. Apparently, there were some real horrors. TB does something weird to the chromosomes. She saw newborn babies with rudimentary feathers on them and another one born with scales. Eventually, she left that job and worked for a time as a librarian, but then she stopped working for a while. I didn't quite understand the pressure she was under, and I figured we'd be alright. Later on, she was a bartender, but that was after she married my stepfather. I had problems at school right from the start. The teachers and I didn't see eye to eye. They wanted me to learn, and I didn't want to. I was always like a black hole when it came to math. He might as well have spoken Swahili to me as tried to teach me algebra, so I gave up on it early. I figured I wasn't going to be a mathematician, so I might as well off. I played truant constantly, and that was it from day one, really. The first episode of my difficult schooling that I remember clearly was at primary school. This stupid woman wanted to teach the boys knitting. She was probably a feminist, right? I must have been about seven, so really, it was a bit pointless. And this woman was a real brute, too. She quite enjoyed hitting kids. I wouldn't knit because it was sissy. In those days, we still had sissies, see? They weren't running the country like they are now. I told her I couldn't do it, and she hit me. Then I said I couldn't do it again, and after a while, she stopped hitting me. Honestly, though, I think hitting a kid's good for him if he's a bad kid, not if he gets hit indiscriminately. But when he does something wrong, it'll stop him from being bad early if he's terrified of the teacher. I used to get a regular. I got the board rule, the T-square that hung near the blackboard. The teacher would stand behind us, and he'd whop it in the back of your head. Later on, the physics teacher would hit us with the leg of a chemistry stool. That was a good one, but I never got it because I was pretty good at physics. That is, until I left school by mutual agreement. If you get a good smack around your ear so it rings and sings for about half an hour, you're not going to do that again in class. You're going to listen to what you're being told. That's how it worked, but now it's gone. It worked for me, and it worked for my generation pretty well, because as far as I can see, we're smarter than this generation shaping up to be. Anyhow, my mom remarried when I was ten. Her, his name was George Willis, and she met him through my uncle Colin, who was her only brother. I think the two of them were friends in the army, Colin and George, that is. He had played professional football for Bolton Wanderers, and as he told it, he was a self-made man with his own factory, which made plastic shoe stands for shop windows. That went bust about three months after my mom married him. He was too much. He was funny as He kept getting busted for selling purloined washing machines and fridges off the backs of lorries, but 
he wouldn't tell us about it. He used to say that he was off on a business trip. You know, I'll be gone about a month, darling, and he'd go and do 30 days in jail. We didn't find out about this for a while, but he turned out alright in the end. With him, of course, came his two children from his previous marriage, Patricia and Tony. I was the youngest of the three and was constantly being bullied by these huge, newly acquired siblings. And I had a very fraught relationship with my stepfather because I was an only child, as far as my mother was concerned. She used to fight like a bantam for me, so he'd get a terrible hard time. Patricia's lofty ambition was to work at the treasury, of all things, and eventually our dreams came true. Tony lives in Melbourne, Australia, head of some plastics division. I didn't know plastic was hereditary. He went in the merchant navy for about 10 years and didn't write to us for nearly 20. My stepfather thought he was dead. When my mom and stepfather married, we moved to his house in Ben Lech, a seaside resort on Angelesi. It was about this time that I began to be known as Lemmy. It was a Welsh thing, I believe. I was in a very bad school, being the only English kid among the 700 Welsh. That was made for fun and profit, right? So I've been known as Lemmy since I was around 10. I didn't always have the mustache. I've only had that since I was 11. But I did manage to entertain myself by stealing some galignite and rearranging the coastline of Angelesi. There was this construction company redoing all the drains in the village. They could only work in the summer because after that the weather got too cold. So they used to pack up around September or October and they would stash all their supplies in these porta cabins. And around the end of October, beginning of November, me and some friends would break into them. I mean, if you're a boy of about 10 or 11, it was like finding buried treasure. We found caps and overalls, galignite and detonators and fuses, all kinds of wonderful we would bite the detonator onto the fuse and shove it into the galignite. Then we'd dig a hole in the sand on the beach, shove the contraption down it, twill the fuse out, and cover it up. We'd finish up by putting a big rock on top, lighting the fuse, and running like bloody And BOOM! The stone would fly 50 feet in the air. It was great! Later I'd find crowds of people standing there in the rain looking at the damage and muttering, what do you think? I don't know, aliens? <laughs> I have no idea what the village copper thought was going on, because he'd hear all these terrifying bangs, and he'd come out to the beach, and half the cliff had slid into the sea. About two miles of coastline was different when we were finished with it. Just innocent fun, right? Cool kids get up to all kinds of <laughs> And after all, why not? That's their job, isn't it? To make their elders mad and give them a cross to bear? Otherwise, what use are they? Of course, these were mere diversions compared to my growing interest in the opposite sex. You have to realize that in those days, the 50s, there wasn't Playboy or Penthouse. The kicks then were those magazines that featured things like nudists playing tennis, health and efficiency, and That's what an awful world the 50s were, and people call it the age of innocence. That you try living in it. My sexual education began when I was very young. My mother brought home about three uncles before we decided on one being dad, but that was always fine with me. I figured she was lonely, and she was working all day to feed me and my granny, so I didn't mind going to bed a bit early. And growing up in a rural area, one would find people going at it in the fields. Plus, there were always cars, of course, with the windows steamed up. You could always get a good look at a bared leg or breast as the couple crawled from the front into the back seat. In those days, the fashion was those skirts with the two petticoats underneath, which you whizzed around dancing the jive, so I used to dance a lot. I gave up dancing when the twist came in, because it offended me. You couldn't touch the woman anymore. Who wants that when you've just discovered adolescent lust? I needed to get close and warm, tactile, hands-on, experiencing, giving and receiving, and stuff like that, you know? But it was when I was 14 and working at the writing school that I really discovered my lust and desire for women of all shapes, sizes, ages, colors, and creeds, in political persuasions. The whole of Manchester and Liverpool would come down to our little seaside resort town every summer. College students on holiday would take out the rides at this school. And the girl guides would come every year in mass. The whole troop, with their tents and gear, and there were all of two guide mistresses to look after them. Ha! 
Who were they kidding? We were going to get those chicks if we had to don wetsuits. And the girls obviously felt the same way. They were eager to learn, and we were eager to learn. And between us, we learned it. Believe me, we learned every <laughs> note. I got a job at the riding school because I loved horses. I still do. We had a good time there because horses made women horny. There's a sexual power to a horse. Women would rather ride a horse bareback, and it's not for the obvious reasons. I think it's to feel the animal's body next to the skin. Through a saddle, you can't, especially an English saddle. And then there's the fact that they're strong, too. A horse can do anything it wants with you, really, but it doesn't. Except for a small minority, they aren't temperamental animals. They give in to you. I think that's what women like about horses, of being so strong that it gives in without fighting back, or at least trying to assert its rights. It won't do the washing up, but that's a small price to pay. I was in love with Anne. She was five years older than me, which at that age is an impossible gulf to cross. But I can still recall how she looked. Very tall, mostly legs, sort of a broken nose on her, but she was well attractive. She went out with this really ugly geezer, though. I couldn't understand that. I caught them once in a barn, and I tiptoed out going, But the funniest story regarding those girl guides involved a friend of mine called Tommy Lee. Tommy only had one arm. He was an electrician, and one time he put his finger on the wrong wire, and the shock literally burned his arm off up to the bicep. They had to remove the rest of it and stitch up his shoulder. He was never quite the same after that. He used to listen to a lot of things that only he could hear. But anyway, he had this false arm with a black glove on it, which he would hook onto his belt or put in his pocket. So one night, the two of us sneaked over to the girl guides. We crawled under the hedge and through the gorse. But when you're 14, you don't care, do you? You'll do anything for a piece. We finally got there and I went into this one tent with my bird, and Tommy went in the other tent with his. Then it all went quiet, you know, apart from the sound of bed springs. Afterwards, I dozed off for a bit, like people do, because it all just felt so nice. That's why I keep doing it. Then I was startled awake. Whack! Ow! Whack! Ow! Whack! Ow! Whack! Ow! So I peeked under the tent flap, and there was Tommy, stark naked, with his clothes under his one arm, running like a maniac. Following closely behind was a furious guide mistress beating him on the head with his own arm. I laughed so hard they caught me. I couldn't move. I couldn't run. I was just helpless. That was one of the funniest things I'd ever seen in my life. My initial discovery of sex came before rock and roll because you have to realize that for the first 10 years of my life, rock and roll didn't even exist. It was all Frank Sinatra and Rosemary Clooney and how much is that doggy in the window? That one was on the top of the charts for months. I experienced the birth of rock and roll firsthand. I heard Bill Haley first razzle dazzle. I think it was. Then there was Rock Around the Clock and See You Later Alligator. The Comets were a very poor band actually, but they were the only ones at the time. Plus, it was tough up in Wales. You could get Radio Luxembourg, but that was patchy. It would fade in and out, and you had to keep on twiddling the knob to get any kind of reception. Then you'd never find out what they were playing because they announced it once at the beginning, and if you came in five or eight bars into the song, they'd never mention the guy's name again. It took me months to find out the name of What Do You Want to Make Those Eyes at Me For by Emily Ford and the Checkmates. There's a geezer who just vanished. Emily Ford and the Checkmates had five hits in England. He was huge. And then, there was a scandal. He was caught charging a kid money for an autograph, and that's what killed him. The checkmates went out on their own for a while after that, but it was no good. Then, if you wanted a record, you had to order it and wait a month for it to arrive. The first 78 I ever bought was by Tommy Steele, the British answer to Elvis Presley. And then I got Peggy Sue by Buddy Holly. My first full album was The Buddy Holly Story, which I got right after he died. Actually, I saw him perform at New Bridington Tower. See, that shows your age. I saw Buddy Holly live. Nevertheless, I must say, my street cred is impeccable. It was a long time before I bought an Elvis Presley record. The first I purchased was Don't Be Cruel, I Believe. His style, his look was great. He was really a one-off, but I thought he was inferior to Buddy Holly and Little Richard. 
The problem was that he had really naff B-sides. See, albums in those days were different. An album could be a collection of the last six hit singles and the B-sides, so half of the Elvis albums were crap. He only started making good B-sides when he did I Beg of You. Buddy Holly never did a bad track as far as I could hear. Eddie Cochran too was an idol of mine. He used to work at a studio in Hollywood, and if somebody finished an hour ahead of time, he'd dash in and make a record. And he used to write and produce all his own stuff. He was the first one to ever do that, a very inventive guy. I was supposed to see him on the second leg of his tour through Britain, but that was when he was in the accident out by Bristol that killed him. I remember being dismayed. That was a great tragedy for rock and roll. He and Holly were the ones who inspired me to play guitar. I decided to pick up the guitar partly for the music, but girls were at least 60% of the reason I wanted to play. I discovered what an incredible <laughs> magnet guitars were at the end of the school year. You get shunted in the classroom for a week after the exams with nothing to do, and this one kid brought in a guitar. He couldn't play it, but he was surrounded by women immediately. I thought, ah, now that looks like fun. My mom had an old Hawaiian guitar hanging on a wall in our house. She used to play when she was a kid, and her brother would play banjo. Hawaiian guitar had been very popular not long before. There were lap steels with a flat neck and upraised frets. Hers was very smart, covered with mother of pearl inlay. So that was a stroke of luck. Not many people had a guitar lying around the house in 1957. So I dragged the thing into class. I couldn't play it either, but sure enough I was surrounded by women straight away. It actually worked. Instantly. That's the only thing that ever worked so immediately in my life, and I never looked back. Eventually, I got the idea that the girls expected me to play the thing, so I taught myself, which was pretty excruciating on that Hawaiian guitar with the strings raised up. When I was 15, we went on a school trip to Paris, and I learned Rock Around the Clock, so I played that for three hours one night. Even though I just nearly cut my forefinger off with a flick knife that refused to do what it was told, I bled on the guitar and the chicks thought that was absolutely cool. You know, sort of the equivalent of a Sioux warrior going out into the tall grass and killing a bear with his own hands, I suppose. Bleeding for him! Back home, my mother and stepdad knew exactly what I was up to. It was quite obvious. They saw the constant procession of chicks. The garage had been converted into living quarters, which I had to myself, and I'd take the girls there. My stepfather used to come in and catch me going at it. He called me so many times, it was silly. I think he was a Do you know you're on top of that girl? He'd shout. Yes, I know I'm on top of the bloody girl, I'd say. How do you do it? It wasn't long after that Paris trip that I was expelled from school. I played truant with two of my friends. We went on a train to the other side of the island for the afternoon and came back in time for the bus home. But as luck would have it, some from another class saw us on the platform and turned us in. There's always a snitch, isn't there? So, I was taken up before the headmaster. He was a real moron, a do-nothing. I think he became headmaster because he was too old to be a magistrate. For two weeks, he had me in his office every day during break and lunchtime trying to break me down. You were seen by two holy head boys when the train turned around, he told me. It wasn't me, sir, I'd insist. I was never there. That's when I learned to lie. Another thing that discipline teaches you is lying, because if you don't lie, you're in the <laughs> Anyway, to cut a long story in half the length it would have been, he was going to give me the cane, two on each hand. That was right after my accident with the flick knife in Paris, remember? It had taken ages for that to start healing. I mean, you might know how you bleed from a cut like that. Every time your heart beats, brutal. Blood straight across the room. I must have lost a pint at the time. So I asked the headmaster, could I have four on one hand because of my finger? But no, that wouldn't do it for him. He stood there impassive, urging my hand up and whap! Blood all over the place. And as if nothing had happened, he said, put your other hand up. You, I thought. So when the cane came down on my hand, I grabbed it from him and whacked him around the head with it. I think you'll find that we don't need your presence here anymore, he glowered. I wasn't coming back anyway, I told him, and with that, I was out the door. But he was right. I stayed away, and they never came after me for truancy. There was only about six months left to go anyway. I didn't tell my parents about it. 
I would leave like I was going to school every morning and then come back every night. I just used to go up to the riding school and work up there on the beach with the horses, but eventually I got a couple of jobs. One was as a house painter with this gay guy, Mr. Brownsword. What a name. Absolutely perfect. All the same, he never hit on me. He was after my good-looking friend, Colin Purvis, which I was quite pleased about. I left him to it, you know. Colin will paint in here, Mr. Brownsword. I'll go upstairs, shall I? Colin would be muttering, <laughs> under his breath. <laughs> then we moved off the island to a farm in Conwy, along the Wales coast right up in the mountains. That's where I learned to be alone and not mind it. I used to wander around the fields with the sheepdogs. I really don't mind being alone now. People think it's weird, but I think it's great. Around that time, my stepfather got me into a factory that made hot point washing machines. Everyone worked on just one piece of them. I was one of the first in line. I had to take four small brass nuts and bolt them on this thing, and then a machine came down and knocked a ridge across the sides of them. Then you took the pieces off and threw them in a huge box. There were 15,000 of them to do, and when you were done with that batch and really garnered a sense of achievement, they'd come and steal them and give you an empty basket. You can't be smart and do that job, man. It's impossible because it would drive you out of your mind. I don't know how those people did it. I suppose they submerged their intelligence because they had responsibilities. Everyone I knew who left home in search of something better wound up coming back. I had other plans for my life. So I grew my hair till the factory fired me, and I stayed out. I would rather starve to death than go back to that. I'm very lucky and privileged that I escaped. Well, that's the end of chapter one. I love the humor in here. <laughs> I'm looking forward to reading more chapters. Did you like chapter one? Let me know in the comments below. That does it for today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. I really appreciate the support. I'll see you next time. Until then, rock on.